Welcome to Elevate, the podcast where we dissect exceptional achievers who are consistently raising the bar personally and professionally to produce extraordinary results in investment real estate and ultimately in their lives. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chester. I'm so thankful to have you here. I'm so blessed and grateful to be with my bald brethren, Steve Rosenberg. <laughs> Steve, how are you, sir? I'm doing well, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a, it's always a good way to start building a relationship. When we, we look at each other, I'm like, man, you got a shiny dome there. It's my like brother. a mirror. It's like a, I'm looking at myself here. <laughs> exactly. I love it. And, and I, I think we're going to dive a little bit behind that dome and, and try to find out what's going on in the mindset of this individual and uh i'm excited about our discussion today but elevate nation are you ready to take it to another level because i have no doubt that we're going to do that today i want to welcome you back to the show where our mission is to identify and apply how the best of the best raise the bar personally and professionally to achieve greatness in real estate and beyond and we're going to talk mindset we're going to talk tools habits routines systems we're going to talk strategy we're going to talk crisis mitigation we're going to talk crisis navigation we're going to talk about thriving in an environment where most are looking to survive. We're going to talk about what are we, what's the long-term perspective that we need to have here? How do we need to act? How do we need to educate ourselves? And let's build you know, an opportunity for ourselves while others are just trying to survive. And so with that said, you know, this is a masterclass for leaders and those looking to achieve uncommon results and purposeful outcomes through real estate investing and ultimately in their lives. And if you appreciate what we're doing on the show we'd certainly appreciate if you subscribed if you gave us a rating a review it helps us because our goal is to reach millions and millions of people with this message because you know what it's more prevalent than ever that people have been living a life where they just tolerate it and all of a sudden there's a crisis here that we're all dealing with and perhaps you know tolerating is not even going to be an option anymore so what can we do to build a life that has no limits and that has resiliency it has opportunities to create something that you can be proud of. And so with that said, Steve, uh, I want to welcome you to this show. You know, tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Who are you? What's your background? And, and uh, give us a little bit about Steve behind the bio that I know is so extensive and so beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot going on with everybody. And I, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. And, and hopefully, I can impart some, some thoughts uh, to the people watching this. Uh, you know, I, I tell people I'm like an onion. I've got so many layers, man, as deep as you want to go or you just want the outer shell, it's up to you. But, uh, you know, I started this whole journey, if you will, is which is very interesting the way it's almost come full circle after about 20 years that 9-11 is actually what started me down this path. And what I reason it was is my first love, my career uh, is being an airline pilot. And uh, up until the point, I was hired at 25 years old as an airline pilot. I was one of the, probably the second youngest person hired at the company that I was working for at the time. And when you get to that level of being an airline pilot, like, you, you, you know, from the perception that I had was that you've made it, you've got the career, you don't need to do anything else, you're set for life. And I had the best job in the world. I, I really did. I mean, I, as a little kid, I would look up in the sky. I'd see these airplanes and be like, man, I want to do that. Next thing you know, I mean, I work my way through college and all the other things. And I get a job with the airlines. And I'm working for the airlines. And I'm just loving life. And in my mind, I had the best job in the world. And I had the most safest and most secure job in the world. And that was up until about September 10th, 2001. September 11th, as we all know, happened, a very tragic day in, in American history. And September 13th, I recall, was the day of my, I call it my 9-11, because that was the day that I found out my safe, secure job was not. And what happened was, is I was delivered a furlough notice from the airlines saying, thanks for being an employee, but we don't think we're going to need you anymore. We need to protect the shareholders of the company. We need to protect stocks. And basically, we are going to furlough. We are going to abrogate contracts. We are going to wipe out pensions. And we are going to do whatever we have to do to protect the solvency of our company, which to their defense, that is their job. That's what they do. Talk about a punch in the gut when you have a this, you study your whole life and all you're wanting to do is this job, what you're doing. 
And then within a matter of 72 hours, it's ripped away from you like a Band-Aid getting ripped off. And you're standing there saying, I'm basically going to be on the street without a job with 50,000 other airline pilots, the same if not more qualified than me, with no jobs. And so what people, you know, many people I'm sure have maybe had similar situations, but when you're so focused on learning one skill and one craft, you're really not hireable for anything else. Meaning I couldn't get a job. I remember looking in the want ads thinking, what, what would I do? And I couldn't even drive a truck because I wasn't qualified. I didn't have a commercial truck license. And I'm like, I can fly a plane with hundreds of people around, but I can't drive a truck. And that's when I realized that the safe, secure illusion of having a job was actually anything but. And it actually made me the most unsafe and unsecure because I was unhirable for anything else and I didn't know anything else. So that's when I started looking to see what do people that have wealth, what do they do? And it was, I've noticed the trend was that a lot of people were tied to real estate. I didn't know anything about real estate, no one in my family. So I started reading books on real estate and just to date myself, this was pre YouTube, it was 2001, right? So I'm going to, I had to get a library card. For those of you that don't know, there's a place <laughs> with books and it's called a library. I got a library card <laughs> and um, I had to go to the library and check out books on real estate. Um, there was no Amazon yet, really. Um, and so I read about a book a week and I was just, I was digging into this with everything I had because I felt like I was behind the curve of learning because now I'm 29 years old. I don't know if this job is going to stick around. Any hiccup, I was done. Now, just to, to reference, I never actually lost my job. I came within 30 of the bottom of a 6,000 pilot seniority list. Wow. I got pushed out of, I was living in Houston. I got pushed out of Houston. I was living in Newark at the time uh, or flying out of Newark and I was on reserve and you can't really complain because you have a job, right? All of everyone below me did not have a job. And so I couldn't complain, but I realized that I was a cog in a wheel and I could not, I had no control over my destiny. And that's why I really wanted to learn about this real estate. And for those of you that are new to real estate or have been doing this, all of a sudden I'm learning these new words like cash on cash and ROI and all these fancy terms and I'm like, I, what, I have no idea what you're talking about. It was almost like they were speaking Martian to me when I'm going to these meetups and I'm, I'm like the moron, right? I'm like, I don't, can you say that word again? Like I'm writing them down. <laughs> so I ended up learning a lot about real estate and um, I took a course on how to flip properties. It wasn't even flipping. It was how to basically wholesale an option at the time with option contracts, double closings. Had no idea what I was doing, but I was pretty good at it. Uh, I was a pretty good communicator, negotiator. Uh, started getting better at doing that. Actually had a lot of success. So much success that I ended up buying an apartment complex in a partnership uh, here in Houston with the money that I made. Uh, took that. We, we exited that deal. Did very well. Bought single family properties. Um, and... As we bought single family properties, we, we, that's kind of where our story began of making mistakes, bought a lot of bad properties. We didn't have any goals, didn't have any strategies tied to them. We just saw a bunch of properties. We thought we were so smart because we just had an apartment complex and sold it. So we're the smartest guys in the world, made a lot of money. So let's go and show single family how we do this. Well, <laughs> real estate has a way of smacking you in the face very quickly if you don't know what you're doing, which many people are, are experiencing right now. And so after we bought about 20 properties in a year and a half, we realized why many people don't own low income properties. Uh, and I learned that lesson. And so what ended up happening was we uh, started getting our butts kicked with single family homes. And you would think that that would have solved our problem, but it didn't because we thought we were smart enough and we can fix it. So we did what any uh, person who doesn't listen to what the numbers and data are telling them. We bought about another 15 or 20 of them just to prove how right we could be to fix this. 
And that was like gasoline on a fire and it exploding in our faces. Um, so now we have about four, 35 or 40 of these low income crappy properties. And, and the reason they weren't working is not that low income properties don't work. They weren't working for the business model that we were trying to wrap around it. And, and that, that I want to point that out that they do work and you can be successful with the right model. We had zero model. We are just trying to make them passive income and hands off, which is that just does not necessarily work or wasn't working for us, I'll say. We got to a point that we needed to decide what to do. And I, it, our, my horror stories are so bad. I think, I, yeah, I actually wrote a book on my horror stories. I'll, I'll send you one so you can read it. Um, that's how bad my life was. And it got so bad that my wife actually said, if you buy another one, it better be nice because you will be living in it because you <laughs> suck at buying houses. You are no good at doing this because I kept thinking I could fix it. I kept thinking I can get us out of this. And you know, when, when you cause the problem, you want to be the one to fix the problem. And doing that was just putting us deeper and deeper in the hole. And you know, when you're, there's valuable lessons here that we learned that I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Um, we tried to hand them off to a management company and no management company would take them. They were like, these properties will never make money. You will go bankrupt. We don't want them. Wow. And I was like, holy crap, what do we do? So we ended up self-managing and I said, okay, obviously we're not the smartest people in the world because of what we did, but we're not the dumbest. I was, I'm an airline pilot trained by Boeing. I know checklist systemization. My business partner was head of an IT department. So we knew, and we ran an apartment complex. So we knew what to do. We just were not doing it because we were not running it like a business. We were too emotionally close to it. And we were making emotional decisions, not business decisions. So we sat down for about six months. We plumbed the, the right company of how we would want it to run if we hired ourselves. And then we got a business coach. And that was the smartest thing we could have ever done. We went to the business coach. We said, here's what we did. Here's what we have. What do we do? And he said, well, you have opportunity, you have marketability, and you have scalability. So by definition, you have the makings of a business. You two are not the smartest people in the world. You've proven you don't know what you're doing. Whether or not you can make this successful is anyone's guess. So we hired him on the spot. The guy was a great closer, basically. <laughs> and for about seven years, this guy, coach, was our coach. So we started a management company for self-preservation. That grew to us managing for third party for other people. We took that company and grew it to over a thousand properties in three different cities, built it into a multi-million dollar company, and recently exited and sold to a larger company called Mind Property Management. We exited the deal. Um, we now work for and with Mind Property Management, who is a national company in 16 regions. I'm their vice president of investor education, um, talking on a much higher scale. And during this whole transition, he and I did a huge metamorphosis as to who we were. We became business owners. We understood and understand how businesses work and how they don't work, how they fail. And we've learned how to be mentored and coached and trained we've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in ourselves to become the people we are today, um, which is why I'm able to help so many people. I've spoken on stages around the US. I've done tours throughout Australia. Um, I've written a book, podcast shows, all these things. And I think the difference as to why so many people are interested in my take is I don't necessarily talk about real estate. It's all about mindset. And it's about who you become mentally first before you ever buy your first property. And I think a lot of people miss that when it comes to becoming a successful investor. We think four walls and a roof is what makes us successful. And it's really not. That's just a tactic. That's just a car on the highway to your goal. Who you have to become and where you want to go, I think is more important. And that's kind of what I bring to the table. And I know you're big into that as well. Um, but that's my last probably 15 years, 20 years of my life. And so now that this has happened and you're seeing all of this going on. Number one, I can look at people's businesses and say, there's the hole, there's the flaw. But a lot of people are coming back to me saying, Hey, is this like nine 11 where you're not flying and all this is going on? And I explained to them, yes, it is. Except I am in a much different position. I have, I have assets. 
I've got a lot of real estate that I own. I'm partners in other businesses. I've got a lot of stuff because of the education and training that I've done for this kind of day. And it's one of those things they say, you, you know, you practice on the uh, practice field so that you don't bleed on the battlefield. And th this is today is a, a true evidence of that. And in my mind, at least. Are you someone who's seriously looking to elevate your life, your business, your real estate portfolio, your cash flow, your deal opportunities, your access to opportunities, your network this year? Well, if that's you, then I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com because I'm currently opening up a few coaching spots for people like you who want to close the gap from where you are to where you want to be and really, you know, expand that beyond your wildest dreams and explode your business, explode your deal opportunities, explode your vision for what you're looking to create. If that's you, I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. I really have to tell you that this is not for everyone. This is only for those who are decisive. They're committed. They're willing to do whatever it takes. They're willing to invest time, energy, and resources into themselves to get to where they want to be and to live a life without limits, to elevate to a life without limits, which is really what we're all about on this show. If that is you, again, I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. Again, that's coachwithtyler.com. Yeah, it feels like we've been training for this moment, you know, for a long time, you know, at least those in our camp, you know, folks who are committed to investing in their in themselves, as well as their mindset, as well as the systems of their business, because obviously, we've got to be practical at the same point, we can't just be mindful and just be aware of our own emotions and just say, well, you know, let let what is be, you know, be and then, you know, make no change to that, you know, but it is having an understanding of, you know, reality is what it is, but now how do we act, right? And then how do we control our emotions? And then how do we act tactfully? So I'd love to dive in, you know, a little bit deeper in terms of, you know, the, the crisis sort of strategy, sure. crisis management, and, and, yeah. you know, how does that work in terms of starting from a psychological perspective, not only yourself and your team, you know, how are you leading, you know, with the understanding of the survival mechanisms that many have, especially in this type of circumstance. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very great point that you bring up that a lot of people don't really understand. And I, I'd like to dig into this because being an airline pilot, being trained by Boeing for the last 25 years of how to fly very large, sophisticated aircraft that hold many, many people, um, as well as owning a business, I've learned to mix those and understand and I'll, I'll tell you what we're taught by Boeing and by the airlines and how this applies to business. So uh, just to put things into perspective for people that are watching, right now I hear the word emergency a lot from people. We're in an emergency situation. Well, being an airline pilot and flying, I fly a 787 and I fly a route that goes from Houston to Sydney, Australia, which is a 17 and a half hour nonstop flight. Just to, I've done that flight before. It is so yeah, long. <laughs> yes. So I, that's the route I do. So wow. when, when we are trained on an emergency, to us, an emergency is being at 40,000 feet, going 600 miles an hour with 200,000 pounds of fuel, 300 people in the back, and having an engine catch on fire. That is an emergency situation. Yeah. If you were to take that perspective and put it into what we're dealing with right now, I don't put those in the same categories as emergencies. So number one, it's a matter of really putting things into perspective. It, and I'm not making light in saying that what's going on is not serious, but it is not an emergency, right? Yeah. One of the things that we're taught in an emergency situation even something as critical as what I just described, the first thing Boeing teaches us and the airlines teach you is take a breath, sit back and assess the situation before you do anything. So this, how does this apply in business? Exactly the same. Sit back, take a breath and assess exactly what's going on. That's number one in any emergency, okay? really just like, okay, what's, what's actually going on here? Because what you think is going on and what is going on may be completely different. The next thing you're taught is fly the airplane. And what they mean by flying the airplane is, now when I fly, there's three or four of us in the cockpit and it's, okay, I have the aircraft, you work the checklist, you call air traffic control, and what you're doing is, is you're delegating duties 
and you are now becoming the leader of the situation. So there's a big difference in business, and you, you actually said it, in leadership versus management. Okay. And a lot of people really are managers, and they mask that and call that leadership. A manager tells people what to do. A leader has people following them because they take control of a situation. Right now, in this situation, even if you have one person that works with you, or zero, you have to put on the leadership hat. You have to say, I've got control of the situation and start delegating what needs to be done in task specific order. You don't want two people grabbing the checklist. We don't want two people flying the plane. So it's a matter of delegating it. And people in this situation, they want to be led and they wanna to be told it's going to be okay. Even if it's not going to be okay, you don't tell them we're all going to die. You say, you know what? It's okay. We've got this. You may not be thinking you do, but the reality is, is they want to be told it's okay. And so that becomes their reality, right? Whatever we manifest and think about becomes our reality. Mm -hmm. So if we sit there and say, okay, you know what? It's okay. I've got this. We're going to fly the plane. We're going to deal with this. So delegate who is doing what in your business. The third thing that we are taught identify your specific problem. Now, if we have an engine on fire, we need to put the fire out, not shut off a hydraulic line. That's not gonna help that problem, right? And the reason this is relevant to people that have businesses is identify what is your specific problem in your business. I don't care if I have a property in Houston, Texas, that's a rental property. I don't care what's going on in China or Australia, or New York, or that California is in a shutdown. I really care right now. My problem is, does my resident have a job and can they pay their rent? That is my problem. Everything else is static and noise. You've got to reduce the noise and you have to isolate the problem. And it's, it's, we call it compartmentalizing, isolating the situation. You've really got to isolate what is going on and what is your specific problem. Now, someone in California has a different problem. I don't care what their problem is right now. I care about my problem, right? So when you're in a plane, we have a problem that we have to identify. The, the, biggest pro, the biggest challenge that we all have is right now, everybody focuses on that problem and they don't, it's like hitting a bump in your car and now you're trying to drive your car through the rear view mirror looking at that problem. You got to focus on the solution, which is step number four. The problem happened. Nobody can change what happened in the past. We can't go back three weeks from now and fix this problem. It is in the, it, it's in the history books. It's done. That chapter's over. That ship sailed. How do we go to the solution? Many, many people focus on the problem, which just manifests a bigger problem because that's all you're focused on. The problem is the problem. We can't fix that. But what we can do is we can work to the solution. In hockey, they call it skating to where the puck's going to be, not where it's at, right? And so if you think about what is the solution and how do I work with my residents and contractors or property managers and attorneys and real estate agents, how do I get everyone involved and say, this is a solution mindset. We've got to come to a solution here. That is key because when you start getting, no one's going to have the right answer but maybe collectively you can pool your brains and resources together to come up with a collective right solution for your particular problem. The last thing we're taught is to over communicate with everybody. This is not the time that you hoard your information and do not tell your resident what you're doing. This is not the time you don't tell your attorney, your CPA, anybody. This is the time that you bring everybody in and say, there's no dumb idea. Everything is on the table. Let's figure this out. Because you may be able to talk to your resident and they may have access to credit cards. They may have access to government agencies. They may not know that they have access to government agency help. And you may be like, hey, did you know, let's, let's get on the phone and call some government agencies and see if we can do this together. As of right now, everybody should be on the same side of the table. This is not a negotiation. This is a, hey, we're all in this together. The resident didn't ask for this to happen. 
The owner didn't ask for this to happen. I mean, nobody asked for this to happen, but it did. It just did, right? It sucks for everybody. But you know what? It's, it's about three miles behind us now. Now we got to go to solution. Otherwise, we're going to be driving through the rear view and crash again because we're so focused on what's behind us. So just to, you know, and that, that's a long explanation. Hopefully that helps you. But right. that's how we deal with emergencies in the airlines. And that's how I look at things now. And especially in this situation, you know, are you really doing those steps or are you knee jerk reactioning to the problem and just staring at it? And that's what a lot of people do because they don't know what to do, right? Yeah, I just think it's such a great opportunity for real leaders to step up to the plate now. And while they may be uncertain about what the near future, what the long term future may look like, it's an opportunity for them to step up and say, you know what, whatever that is, we're going to come together and we're going to learn together. We're going to get stronger. We're going to be courageous rather than being fearful. Because look, it's like what you said. I mean, I say this all the time. It's like one of my favorite analogies is that where focus goes energy flows right if you're yep. focusing on the problem you're looking in the rear view mirror well guess what you're probably gonna have another problem coming up to you so if you're focusing on solutions you're you are more likely to get there and i love the thought too about over communication i mean it's like look it, i haven't heard from you what what's going on i need to know and yeah. here's the thing we have so many resources at our disposal to be able to communicate while we may Absolutely. not be able to be six feet from each other right now we've got the opportunity of really i don't know about you but i feel like we've noticed that there's more opportunities to communicate than we even fully realized before so i'd love to just dive a little bit deeper into just leadership and sure. the psychology of a great leader i mean you know what's the makeup and, and what is the inner work required to become that great leader who could calm people in a little bit of turbulence sure and, and let me you know one thing that i have learned is Great leaders are not born, they're bred, and they're trained. So anybody can be a great leader if that is what your focus is on. If your focus is on that you're going to be a crappy leader or crappy owner, that's what will happen. And, you know, when, when we were being coached, you know, and I, I've, I've been coached by many mentors and coaches, and one of the things I've noticed all coaches do or talk about is, you know, they either call it, you know, one was calling it above the line, below the line. They call it cause and effect. But it's, it's ownership, accountability, and responsibility is number one. The other one is blame, excuse, and denial. So or, O-A-R, or bed, B-E-D. And so let's just say cause and effect. A lot of people say like, oh, this happened because I did not have the right business model. I am in this situation because I did not stress test my business and I did not do an analysis of worst case scenario or I over leveraged or maybe this isn't a business model that is sustainable in this environment, right? That's ownership. That's accountability. That's being responsible. What I, I, what I am going to do to fix this next time is X, Y, Z. That's cause. Effect is saying, you know, this happened. This isn't my fault. I'm a victim of society. I'm a victim of COVID. I'm a, that is blame, excuse, and denial. And the leadership needs to step in. And again, at times of stress, when people become leaders, it's not that they have this epiphany and they, they rip off their shirt and they have a cape on and they run on down and they fix things. This is something that they've been trained to do and they understand, and they are just putting their practice into practical application. And I think that's important to understand that this is when it shows that you've been practicing on the practice field so that you're not bleeding on the battlefield. And this is when you're sitting there saying, okay, I've trained for this. Like, for example, for, I'll use the airlines. Every six months, we have to go into simulator trainings and they do all these failing of engines and this and that. And anyone who follows me on Instagram, I post the pictures of the simulators and all that stuff. But this is training for what if. If this ever happens, are we trained for it? So going back to being a leader, I would say, you know, and, I, and I've done a lot of classes of teaching people and coaching people on leadership and accountability. And one of the first things I ask owners of a company is, who do you answer to? Who are you accountable to? And many people, if they own one or two properties, number one, they don't understand that they own a business. And let me just clarify, if you own one property or you own 50 properties, 
you own a business. You've got policies, procedures, structure, laws, government agencies watching you. You own a business. The reason most landlords are in a lawsuit is because they are the ones who never really realize that they own a business and they don't run it like a business. So when I talk to people and ask them, who are you accountable to? Who are your KPIs and metrics do every day? Who do you turn your sheets in as to what you should be doing? And many people will say, well, I don't, I'm the owner of the company. And I'm like, that's your, that's the problem. That's why your company is failing. You are the problem because you are not being a leader. You are not accountable. You don't think you're accountable. There should be a board of directors. There's residents, there's, board, there's banks. You are accountable. They just don't think they are. And that's why they're the problem. So going back to your question, the leader is the person who's practicing that. And I tell people, I go, if you don't do metrics and KPIs and accountabilities and to do's, and you don't have meetings, how could you expect anyone below you to do that? That term, the fish stinks from the head down. Although, you know, if you're not, they're going to go, well, shit, he doesn't show up on time to meetings. Why should I? He doesn't care. He doesn't act professional. He says what he wants to us. Why can't we say what we want to our vendors and contractors? That's a leader, right? A leader does it whether they're being watched or not. Whether it's play time or practice time or real time, a leader is constantly being that person that's accountable, that's responsible, that is taking ownership of the situation. And, and I think that obviously it's a passion of mine because I think it's vital if you own a business, you have a responsibility, if not even to your employees and your staff and your customers, what about to your family? You know, what about, you know, what, what about the people that are relying on you? You're taking time out of your day to go run a business and you're not even taking it seriously and accountable. And I tell them, I go, you, sh maybe you are the problem. You should be the one fired because you're causing everyone else to fail because you're not taking it seriously. Man, it's, there's so much gold here. I mean, you're setting, <laughs> you're setting the tone as a leader, not only for yourself. I think you start there. You set the tone for yourself with your own habits, with your own routines, your commitments, holding yourself accountable for what you said you were going to do, but then doing the same in terms of how are you showing up with your team? You know, it's like, all right, I love just the little thoughts of like, hey, I'm showing up to the meeting on time early, or yeah. I'm prepared for the meeting. I'm prepared with a structure. I've got a board of directors. I've got so many systems that I've built into place and I'm setting the tone with everything that I do, even when times are going well, when times are going well, I'm communicating with confidence. I'm communicating with consistency and all of these things. But then also you have to realize that when times get challenging, when times get a little bit turbulent, you know, it, you've got to be ready to adapt and ready to stay even keeled emotionally as well. But I'd love to know, you know, what would you say are some of the key components to adaptation as a leader and a real estate investor? Well, I think number one, you know, first and foremost, you have to have a goal, right? You, you've got to, you have to understand that you can't do any of this if you don't know where you're going, right? So we'll just talk about real estate investors. I get a lot of people that will reach out to me and ask me for help or to mentor them or coach them. And they'll say, hey, can you, can you help me? And my first question is, is where are you going? Where's the destination as to why you're doing this? If they don't have that answer, that's like, I explained them, that's like you saying, hey, Steve, can you give me directions? My first question is gonna be, where are you going? <laughs> and if they say, I don't know, I'm going to say, well, then I can't give you directions anywhere. So the way, the way that I kind of, you know, kind of dumb it down, will say is you have to really ask yourself, what is it I want as a result of owning this business of owning real estate? What, what is this going to give me? What does this represent? Because real estate is a vehicle. It's an inanimate object, right? So if you said my life, let's just use terms here. My life is Disneyland when I retire. I want, you know, $5 million in assets. I want $50,000 a month coming in. This is what I want. And this is my Disneyland. Okay. That's the destination that we want to go. Now we know what that is. And that is your why. That's why you are doing this right now. The how is the strategy. And the way I explain it is these are the freeways to get you to Disneyland. So if you said, Hey, Steve, I want to go to Disneyland. I would say, okay, well, we got to take the five freeway to the 405 to the 91, get off on beach Boulevard. And, and that's how we're going to get you to Disneyland. That is the buy and hold. I'm going to flip. I'm going to do Airbnb mobile homes. 
these are just freeways to take you to your destination. When people ask me, Steve, does this deal make sense? I look at this and say, is this part of your plan? Is this taking you to your goal? And if it's not, then I would say, then no, it's not a good deal for you based on your goals and based on your strategy. Because you've got goal, then you have the strategy, which is the freeway, and the tactic is the car. So whether it's a three, two, four, two, in a good neighborhood, A, B, C, whatever it is, that's the car, that's the tactic. The freeway is, are we on the right freeway? So now let's say we're on a freeway and we're go going to Disneyland and your wife is like, wait a second, I'm going to Magic Mountain. So there's not an alignment as to where your destination of goal is different than her destination and there's no family alignment. So my next question I tell people is, have you talked to everyone involved that's in your immediate vicinity, meaning your, your, your wife, significant other, child, whoever's involved, and have you actually sat down and said, okay, this is the good, this is the bad, this is the ugly, this is where I think it's gonna go, and actually have a no shit, real conversation saying, this is the amount of time I'm thinking it's gonna take us, this is how much capital it's gonna take us, this is best case scenario, this is worst case scenario, and here's the, this shit hits the fan scenario, and here's our contingencies if that happens. Most people don't do that, I know, because I didn't do that, right? I was painting the rosy picture, and you know, I'd buy houses and slip the HUD statement into the file so that she wouldn't notice, and she was doing the books on the houses, and she's like, do you think I wouldn't notice that we have another house? And I'm like, <laughs> oh yeah, we, we picked that up. But there was no alignment, you know? And so it's so important to make sure that everyone is in the right car going to the same destination on the freeway because a lot of people do not have that alignment. And I, I do that a lot with family, with couples, and I have a conversation. You end up kind of being a marriage counselor because they're like, they do not believe in what you're doing. And all of a sudden, you know, I think as entrepreneurs, we tend to be very selfish. And the reason I say that is we become selfish with our time because we go to seminars, we listen to audiobooks. We take courses, right? But we keep that all internally locked in and we don't share with them the vision and the goal of where we're going. So they're like, shit, I thought you were just, I thought this was like fun for a couple of years. Now I got to give you, now I got to find 20 grand to do a rehab and replace a roof. I'm not doing that. No way. Like we're not doing that. Now it's a problem because it was not communicated going back to the communication with that. And again, I'm not, I'm not immune to this. I, I did this as well, you know? Yeah. Um, and I just think it's important that everybody be in the right car going on the right freeway to the right destination. And that's, I help people doing that because I think it's vital. The mindset before you do anything, before you ever buy a deal, you know, like I tell people, let's say you're in the San Francisco Bay area and they're like, well, based on my goals, no properties here match my strategy. I'm like, well, maybe you need to find a freeway that's out of state because yeah. it doesn't work. Well, how do I find one out of state? Well, first you assemble the team. You make, you take the time and lay the groundwork in the foundation before you pour the concrete for your freeway. That's building the team. That's having the right mentors, right? Right, everybody. And then the last piece of the puzzle is buying the car and putting it on the freeway. The property is an inanimate object. It's a mathematical equation. It has nothing to do with your goals and strategies it's just a means of getting you to where you want to go. And a lot of people, they get caught up in the fact that they say, well, I want a property that's in my neighborhood. And I'm like, really, why? I just feel comfortable. And I'm like, okay, well, are you an appraiser? No. Are you an inspector? No. Are you a handyman? No. I'm like, <laughs> I, and so my, my, my question back to them to put it in a, in a, a realistic term, I say, do you own any stock? And they say, yeah. And I say, okay, is all the stock you own in your neighborhood from the businesses? And they're like, no. And I go, well, do you give me a name of a stock that you own? And they said, Chase. Okay. So before you bought Chase Bank, did you actually go to the building and stick your head into the board of directors meeting and be like, Hey guys, I want to make sure everyone's cool. I'm going to buy about 50 shares. I want to <laughs> make sure everyone's happy. I, you know, I'm going to be an owner here. They're like, no. I said, how'd you buy it? Based on the numbers. That is the same exact thing as a rental property. It's a financial vehicle. That, that's why syndications can work. That's why all these other things can work because it's just numbers. You know, if you look at an apartment complex or a house, it's four walls and a roof. 
not apartment, obviously more walls, but it's four walls and a roof. It's the business running inside of that four walls and a roof that is going to make or break your goals and your strategy. The four walls and a roof is not going to do anything. It's not going to magically spit money out of its butt. You know, it's, it's right. the way it's going to work is by the business model that's wrapped around that. And that's what people have a hard time understanding. They think that just because they bought a great deal, they're set. You and I probably know many, many people that have bought great deals and have single-handedly run them into the ground because they don't know what they're doing. Unfortunately, yes. I and know it had that. nothing to do with the property or the deal. No, it's about the people. It's about the operation. It's about the strategy. It's about the commitment. It's about the team. You know, it's about the leader's mindset. It's about how much is this leader continuing to invest in himself or herself. And with that said, you know, one of the things, actually one of the analogies that I love, I mean, you talk so much about analogies and you bring, you know, you're talking about vehicles, you're talking about highways, you're talking about being a pilot and also as a real estate investor, you know, one of the analogies that I love is that, you know, if that plane has got some turbulence, if you got some issues, you need to take care of yourself first, right? You've got to put yep. that mask on first and get yourself oxygen before you can help someone else. So I'd love to know, you know, how are you investing in yourself as a leader, as an educator, as a real estate investor? Um, talk to me about that. Yeah. So investing in myself is huge. I, I, I am a huge, huge believer. If I, if I could turn my screen around, which would be too hard, my <laughs> wall has my I am statements and the things that I do every day. And I, every morning I wake up and I've been recently learning to meditate which sounds weird, but I'm learning to do it. And I actually like it because it's getting me more focused in my sp specific things that I do. Um, I, I, I am a huge believer in development. I mean, I listen to, I listen to anything, Tony Robbins, Andy Frisella, Grant Card. I mean, I, I listen to anything because all these people are, they are where I want to be. You know, I, 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 have, I have very, very good friends that have mentored me that I've become friends with that have elevated me to a level that I'm like, I want to, these guys fly in private jets. Those are the people that I want to hang out with. Those are the people that I want to aspire to be. And the only way they do it, you talk to all these people and they're like, you know what? It takes hard freaking work and you got to be determined. You got to want it. Nobody, you know, you can build a $3 million business or a $5 million business halfway. You're not going to build a $50 million business by chance. Yeah. You've got to want it and you've got to be focused. So I am a huge believer in self-development. I'm a huge believer in being better. And, you know, all of these people, when you look at these people that are ultra successful in their own right, you think, okay, they don't have more hours in the day than I have. They don't, they you know, like, when I, I've really looked and talked with a lot of them and I've gotten, I've had like in-depth personal conversations and I'm like, what do you do differently? And it's all about how they view themselves and they, they, they work on themselves. Like they're their own mechanics. They're constantly being better. They're, they're honing in on their craft. They're making sure that they're thinking correctly. They don't let negative thoughts come in. You know, they're very, very protective of their time. They're very selective with who they allow to talk to because they don't want that getting in their head. These are things, these are focused. And I, you know, I, I've learned, someone taught me something one time that I thought was very important. I didn't realize it at the time. Um, I was trained by a gentleman named Marshall Silver who is a, a, a business hypnotist. The guy is amazing. Talk about getting in your head, right? So <laughs> one day he sits there and he says, Steve, he says, this is when our business was first starting. And this guy, if you, anyone who knows who Marshall Silver is, he's a very, very intentful, focused individual. Um, and so we were at his house uh, for, for a weekend uh, learning from him. And he says, Steve, could your business do a million dollars this year? And I think we had done like 800,000 in revenue. And I said, yeah, we could, we could do it. We could do a million. He said, okay. He said, could you do three? I said, man, I, uh, I said, well, I, I, you know, I'm trying to be a go-getter. I'm like, yeah, I think we could do three. He goes, good. He goes, how about five? He goes, could you do five? I'm like, Ooh, I don't know. I'm like five, five would be tough. You know, your, your actually stomach starts, <laughs> you know? And he's like, say you could do five. Tell me, tell me you could do five. And I'm like, I'm like, I could do five, but I didn't believe it. <laughs> so then he says, can you do 10? And I'm like, no, I'm like, I, we, we can't do 10 million. He goes, how about 50? He goes, can you do 50? I'm like, no. And I'm thinking to myself, I just said I couldn't do 10. I'm pretty sure I can't do 50. <laughs> he says, so what, he goes, let me explain to you what you just did. He says, 
you were sure at a hundred, you were sure at a million. He goes, at three, you weren't sure. At five, you pretty much were shutting down. He goes, even though I told you to say it, you were very apprehensive to even say it. He goes, you couldn't even say the word. He goes, and anything over five, you shut it out. He goes, you never even thought of 10 and you never thought of 50. He goes, but what you don't realize is what if I said, I have a friend that's willing to invest $50 million in your business to make it grow. He goes, you would never see that person cross your path because you have mentally shut them off. Mm. And he goes, you will never see that $50 million person and you will never grow your business to what it could be because you are the problem and the reason you're not growing your business because that money is made up in your head. He goes, it really, he goes, you couldn't even say the word. And I was like, wow, that was, that is that was massive. a huge, massive movement for me to really think that through. And he's like, it's just a word, man. Just say it. <laughs> and I, I still had a hard time saying it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's such a great, you know, we have got to dive so deep into this because what your mind can believe and conceive is what it can achieve. And that's it really. Otherwise, because if you don't think big enough, then you're not going to go there. And, Absolutely. you know, there's such a, there's actually, you know, this deep psychological concept, you know, that I'm sure you're aware of is the reticular activating system. Raz, when, you, yeah. when you give yourself the opportunity to recognize that something is possible and that something exists, your mind starts to work, your subconscious mind starts to work and leverage your talents, your skills, your world, your, your universe, and coalesces yeah. to create that actual reality. And that's exactly what you're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, your, your mind cannot hold two beliefs at the same time. You can't say that I'm a winner and I suck. <laughs> right. It's only going to go with one. So, and it doesn't know the words don't and can't. So like, you know, when you're golfing and you're like, don't miss, don't miss, don't miss, don't miss. And then you miss, and you're like, oh, I knew I was going to miss. It's like, <laughs> well, you just told yourself what you were going to do. It doesn't know the word don't. It yeah. just knows miss. And, and so when you think about what you say in business and what you say on a daily basis and, and Marshall was really big on like, don't make fun of yourself. Don't make light. Don't put yourself down. He's like, because whatever you say, will manifest to be true. Mm. And it's so true because if, if you're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm not really that good in business. And he's like, don't say that. And I remember, and so here's a true story. I was speaking with him at an event in Seattle and, and I'm, I'm very good friends with him. And he was flying back to Vegas on his private jet. And he says, hey, we're, you know, what are you doing after this? And I said, oh, I said, I'm, I'm gonna hop back to Houston. And he's like, I said, oh, unless you want me to hop with you on your, on your plane. And he's like, yeah, sure. You know, and part of with Marshall is, is once you go through his program, like you're, you know, you have access to him. And so we're, we're, I, I was like joking. And so the event's over and he's like, you ready to go? And I was like, Oh man, I was just kidding. He's like, no, no. He's like, I'm not taking you to Houston, but he's like, I'll take you to Vegas. You can hop to Vegas with me. And I'm like, okay, cool. He's got a private jet, you know? So we, we go to the thing. It's me, him and his wife. Right. So we get on the jet and, um, he says, I said, man, Marshall, you know, I want to get better at being a speaker and a presenter. I really want to, I want to get my, I want to increase the level. And he says to me, he's like, Steve, you are very, very good as a speaker. You are one of the, you are one of the few that I can say has a lot of potential to be one of the best out there. And I said, man, I said, I, I said, well, thanks. I said, I'm not, I'm not that good. And he goes, let me tell you something. He goes, you are in a private jet with me. I'm one of the best speakers in the world. I'm telling you that you are good. I have no reason to tell you you're good. If I thought you sucked, I would say you sucked. <laughs> he said, be careful what you tell yourself. He said, because that will become your collar that you wear is that you're not a good speaker. He said, I'm telling you, he said, you know what you say when someone like me says that you're a good speaker? And I'm like, what? He says, thank you. That's all that you say. Now you can say you want to get better, but you have to acknowledge the compliment. And I think a lot of times, and I have a hard time doing that because I've, I've spoken all over the world and I, and, I, and I believe that I'm a good speaker, but I also believe I can be a better speaker. Mm -hmm. So I'm always trying to improve. He says, thank you. I am still trying to get better, but mm -hmm. don't put that negative connotation. And those are the words that we tell ourselves that become manifestations of who we are. So I, I'm a huge believer in constantly trying to be better and I'm learning that and it's the brain is very interesting. You know, what we do, what we say to ourselves, 
these kinds of situations that are going on, are these realities or are these made up in our heads? You know, like mm. all these people are talking about this pandemic and horrible things. Isn't that, I talk to management companies that I know and they're like, yeah, out of, you know, 5,000 properties, 20 people can't pay their rent. Wow. Okay. So it's not the, the final coming of this black cloud that's coming to us. It's that's what we have been made to believe. And that's what the news is telling us. And 70% of our thoughts in our brain are negative. So when we watch the news, we like that because we go, well, shit, our life's not as bad as that guy. We're doing okay. He died. I'm alive. So, you know, and so that's why we watch news and other things, um, which is why the news always says negative the news never talks about good positive stuff. Yeah. And, and so you really got to be careful who you're around and what you allow yourself to be told. Yeah, because it comes down to your identity. You know, what you tell yourself and what you believe internally is your identity. And that's how you show up. And now Absolutely. obviously you show up today as someone who's a great communicator and someone who's a clear and articulate communicator because of the identity that you've, you know, really kind of built in yourself. And I just admire that so much. And I also, I love the thought of, you know what, I'm, I am a good speaker now, but I'm wanting to improve in the future. And that kind of, you know, it, it reminds me of really everything like within our lives as, you know, as an individual, as a business person, as a real estate investor, it's like, yeah, I'm really proud of where I am right now, but I've got still more room for improvement, but then also not beating yourself up. So you talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And that's huge. I mean, I, I you, you talked about your, your reticular activating system, your RAS. I'm a, I'm a huge, you know, I understand that. And, you know, they, they have I am statements, you know, and I'm sure you're familiar with those. And yeah. every single morning, I write my I am statements. It's, it's basically for those watching. It's basically what you profess to be in the future. You say it in a, in a current model. So, you know, it could be, I am in the best shape of my life. It could be, I am successful. I am earning $2 million a year. I, I had said, I am speaking on stages around the world. That happened. I am a published author. That happened. I also said, I'm a great golfer. That has not happened yet, but I'm hoping it <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I say these things and you say it because what happens is your mind wants to make that work because you're saying, I am this. Your mind doesn't know, well, I don't think I am, I'm not sure. I am a top speaker in the real estate thought industry. I, I am the top speaker in real estate. That's what I tell myself, right? So now I'm asked to be on all these shows and they're like, man, you're one of the top people out there. And I'm like, is that coincidence? I mean, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a big, I, I, I can't say that one is for the other, but I think, I, I don't think that it's one thing. Like, for example, I get a lot of people that constantly say like, hey, Steve, what's the one thing I can do? What's the one thing? And I tell them, I said, there's no magic handshake that I do every morning or high five that I give that makes me who I am. I'm the sum of the little things that I do every day. That's why everything you do matters. How you think, what you say who you surround yourself with. So I'll give an example. When it comes to aviation and whenever there is a crash of an airplane in the, in the airline world, they will di they'll basically dissect that crash and see all the flags and things that led up to that crash, okay? And when that happens, they're able to say that, okay, first, both pilots didn't get a good night's sleep. Then maybe one was arguing with his wife. Then they kind of didn't really, they were late pushing off the gate. And so it wasn't one thing. It was a addition of multiple things. Well, there is an average statistically of things that cause a crash, a number. What, what number would you guess is the average mistakes that happen that end up causing the crash? Man, that's a good question. I have no idea. I'm going to go with three. 13. 13. Wow. I 13. was way off. Okay. There's, and again, it could be something little like they missed the radio call, right? So think about this. Think if, if you were driving your car and you were leaving your house and you're arguing with your wife and you're late and it's raining and you're texting mm. and you're pissed off. All of these things are red flags that are leading up to you maybe rear ending someone. Now yeah. I get the crash is the end result, but it yeah. wasn't just the crash that happened. It was everything leading up to it. So my, what I tell people is, is if statistically it's 13 things that cause a crash, couldn't you say maybe it's 13 things that cause success? I, I don't know, but a, I it's this. a great way to look at it. So it's not, yeah. it's, it's the sum of the parts. It's the multiple things that we do. Like 
I get up every morning at 4 a.m. I do my I am statements. I do this. I do that. I listen to my audio. It takes me an hour, right, to do all these things, meditate. It's like I got a whole trail of shit I got to do in the morning. <laughs> then I go to the gym. I work out at the gym for two hours. Then I come home. It's, so people are like, man, how do you do that? I'm like, you just do it. They're like, oh, I don't know if I could get up at four in the morning. I'm like, and you probably won't because you just told yourself you can't. You can, you just choose not to, right? Whether it's 4 a.m. or 3 a.m. Or, or 1, I don't, I don't care. Make a commitment. Don't tell yourself you can't do it. Like I, when people say that to me, I'm like, do you know how stupid that sounds? You can't get up at 4 a.m.? Really? Like, is there a law? Is there, is there a restriction? Like you could go on three hours sleep if you had to. What's more right. important? What's your why? And so it's all the culmination of little things that I do to be, it's like, I don't have this amazing amount of willpower. I just do a lot of little things consistently. And I tell people, it's not a matter of one thing. It's a lot of little things that make it consistent. And even, you know, before we sold our company, we were very well known in the industry as having a great company with systems and procedures. And people said like, man, how do you get such good employees? And, and we had outsourced about 50 to 60% of our business was outsourced to Mexico with virtual assistants because we were so good at systematizing. We did so good. We actually started a company in Mexico outsourcing to other people. But we had so many people asking us, how, how do you guys get such good employees? And we're like, it's not one thing that we do. It's the fact that we, have, we don't have one great employee. We have a good bunch of good employees that believe in what we're doing and they're trained very well. That's the difference that people need to think about. Man, this is so key. And I just, you've got to highlight, I mean, I actually, I, 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 there's a quote that I'm aware of, and I'm sure you are too, but excellence is the relentless execution of the boring basics. It's all you know it what? is, man. It's not sexy. It's no. not a one, you know, silver bullet. You know, there's not one to two books that you can read and your whole life is going to be changed. You got to stack those on top of each other. You've got to pour into yourself daily. You got to pour into your team, into your habits, into your conscious habits into your psychology and understanding all of these different things. And you can combine these to then create something great. And so I love it so, so much, man. This has been an absolute blast, Steve. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I want to dive into our rapid fire section. We call it the rare air questionnaire because absolutely you're an extraordinary individual and you're doing extraordinary things. And this is uncommon results. You're raising the bar consistently. We're going to continue to push that bar. I'd love to know, what are two or three of the most impactful books if you had to distill it down to just a few uh, books that have really changed your life? Yeah, so the one, the one that changed my life the most, I would say is 10X from Grant Cardone. I just, I love that book. I love the way the guy thinks. People have opinions. I, I really don't care what they think. I, I think the guy is, uh, I mean, he's a hard charger, man. He's a grinder. Yeah. Um, so I like 10X. I like the book E-Myth. Um, Cause that explained a lot to me on how systems work to automate. Um, one of the things I think is important for people to understand when I talk to people and I coach them or help them and they say like, I have a business, you know, the definition definitions are very, very important. And most people cannot give me the definition of a business to me, the definition of a business as I've been trained and coached is a commercial profitable enterprise that runs without you and has a sale date attached to it. So when we were being coached by our coach and the guy who started the whole thing, Brad Sugars, who has 1,800 coaches who eventually actually became a business partner of ours. Um, that's how, how good we got. Um, but he told us, he said, guys, when are you selling your business? And we're like, what do you mean? Like, we're like, sell it. He's like, give me a date. And we're like, we don't want to sell our business. He said, I didn't ask you if you wanted to sell it. I asked the date you're going to sell it. And he said, the reason you have to have a date is that means your business is running without your involvement. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not a business, it's a job. Yeah. And he said, I want a date. And we we're like, 2020. He's like, that's not a date. I want a day. So we're like, November. November what? November 18th, 2020. Well, we ended up selling our business October 1st, 2019. Wow. Is that coincidence? I don't know. But, but those are the things I've learned by being coach. And, and so I kind of got off track here, but I think it's important for people to realize that this is what these books teach you, yes. how to automate and systematize. Because he's like, if you don't have that, you don't have a business, you have a job. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but make sure you understand what it is you have. Well, and it's oh, just, 
it's awesome too, because not only coaching and books can plant these ideas into your mind, which then manifests, which you've said so many times today. And so if you can expand your mind through your thinking, through your study, through who you surround yourself with, through listening to podcasts like this, what is possible? That's what it's all about. I love that. Talk to me. What's the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis beyond what we've already talked about today? Man, you know, I, I, I am a big believer in helping people. Um, you know, when I first got into this, I didn't have anybody help me, which is a big reason why I had a lot of failures, which I ended up turning those into successes because I learned from them. I, I, am, I am a big believer in helping people. I, I get people on Instagram and Facebook constantly asking for thoughts and opinions and I try to pay it forward and give back as much as I can. So to me, helping people is, is kind of justification that I'm doing the right thing, that I'm on the right track. So I'm, I'm a big believer in, in doing that. And I, I do a lot of work with bigger pockets. You know, that's all free. That's just our free time. And I, and I just, I believe so much in trying to establish a higher level and a higher bar by giving back to people. I, I just think more people need to do that. I love that. And I can just tell the character of who you are by, because of the fact I asked, what do you do to elevate your life on a daily basis? And you told me that you help other people yeah. and that's amazing. And I'd love, you know, really, if there's anything beyond that, you know, my final question for you is what's the best way and biggest way that you elevate others around you. And it sounds like you've already answered that question. Yeah, man. I, I'm a, you look, man, I'd love to make everyone around me a multimillionaire. Cause to me, that just means I'm helping myself and, and I don't define myself by money. You know, I, I could have, I could have sold my company and stopped, you know, I'm still doing this. I'm, I'm working with mine property management, which is a great company in 16 regions. They do awesome. I'm helping them. I'm putting the word out. I don't need, I really don't need to do any of it. I'm an airline pilot. Hopefully after today, I still am, but <laughs> you know, um, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like I, I'm financially, I don't need to do this. I do this cause I really want to help the industry and I want to help people. And, and, I've kind of, not that I've like seen the light, but I, but I really think that we can all get better if we learn how to be focused and serious about what we want to do and take it seriously and be committed to elevating ourselves. Because when we elevate ourselves, man, everybody, the tide rises with everybody. Man, Steve, this has been an absolute blast and you're an incredible individual. I really appreciate you taking time. Is there any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd share with Elevate Nation? Yeah, you know, what I would say is, number one, don't let outside noise derail you. Focus on your why. You know, once you have your why, the how is easy. And, and I, I go back to when they said they were going to go to the moon, they had no idea how they were going to go there. They just knew that they were going and what their why was. The how came, right? Mm. So when you figure out what your why is, it's got to be one of those things that if you're not nervous telling people, the goal's not big enough. And so when you make that goal to where you're actually, you feel dumb saying it and you feel like, wow, I don't even know if I believe it, you're on the right track. And once you have that and you ingrain that and you write it down every day and you look at it, it doesn't become as dumb because you'll start seeing that your brain will manifest to get you there. And it's, it's there's, again, it's a matter of continual progress. It's not a one and done. It, it, it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And if you do it, you will be that person in 20 years that's on a podcast going, this is where I was and this is who I am today. Man, mic drop, mic drop moment. <laughs> Love it. Leave it at that, right? Don't say that's anything it. else stupid. <laughs> yeah, don't screw it up now, Steve. Don't Come screw on. it up. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you again, Steve. Uh, tell the listeners how they, can, how they can stay in contact with you and learn more about you. Yeah, sure. Um, they can uh, find me on Instagram, Rosenberg Steve. So it's R O Z. E-N-B-E-R-G, Steve. Uh, they can find me on Facebook, Steven Rosenberg. Uh, I also have a website they can go to. It's uh, steverosenberg.com. Uh, like I said, I, I do have a book. If you go to the website, you can get it. I'll send you a copy so you can yep. uh, read it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good book of my story and how I went through everything from 9-11 to basically everything that I just told you about. And it's just my, it's, it's just my story, man. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very accessible. If people have questions, concerns, they want to bounce an idea. I get a lot of people and they may not like my answer because it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be a real answer. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but most people are very thankful that I am real with them and I'm giving them the real answer. 
Yeah, well, I can I can definitely tell that you're giving the real answers today, and there's a ton of real wisdom. I mean, we're we're not reading off any scripts here. I mean, this is coming out of this man's beautiful bald dome there. So there's there's tons of wisdom there. So you definitely want to engage with Steve, learn more about him, and and learn from him because he's got so much to give, and obviously he's giving to so many people. And I want to encourage Elevate Nation to re-listen to the show. I mean, I'm definitely going to be doing that myself. You got to take notes. Um, you know, put notes down on paper. And then what sort of ideas did you glean? You know, what seeds were planted into your mind that you can then go ahead and plant into your future for your own manifestation? As corny as it sounds, that's how it happens. Put it into action. You've got to take massive action to make that happen. But beyond that, share this with someone else. Be the teacher because the teacher is who learns the most. As you know, I say that every single time. But, you know, with that said, uh, Steve, thanks again for being here on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And to everybody that's watching, hopefully you got something out of this and you'll be just, you know, you just got to be a little bit better than yesterday. And that's all you need to do every day, be a little bit better. Absolutely. Couldn't said it better myself, Steve and Elevate Nation. Thank you for tuning in and we'll see you next time. This episode of Elevate is brought to you by CF Capital, a real estate investment firm formed by myself and my partner, Brian Flaherty, where we invest in multifamily real estate communities across the Southeast United States. If you'd like to learn more about our approach, our mission, our acquisition criteria, and how you can learn more about future opportunities, visit cfcapllc.com. Again, that's cfcapllc.com. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit tylerchesser.com.